Hi, Scotty and I have been battling through a lot of technical problems to uh, bring you this part two sermon on the armour of God. And it just reminds me of something I said in a previous message on this topic is that although we may take holidays as such, the devil never takes a holiday, he never needs one, uh, and his forces don't either. So we can't think we get a holiday from the spiritual battle. Summer is a great time. I really enjoy summer. But let's not kid ourselves that it's a time that's free of temptation or spiritual attack. It can be actually a very problematic time. I've seen it as a time when many Christians lose uh, discipline and rhythm and get out of good habits that they might otherwise have built up during the more of the working year. They get up later and they might not read their Bibles and all that sort of thing. They can get into areas of financial indiscipline as well. Uh, of course, summer is a time when at the beach people are wearing less clothes, so it's often a time of uh, sexual temptation. All sorts of temptations creep in. It can be a time when people have a shorter fuse because the temperature's hotter, they get a bit impatient, and the red traffic light, of course, only adds to that. It makes us see red, literally. So uh, all sorts of dangers. So good on you that you've taken the time today to listen to this message, to be equipped for the spiritual battle. We're in Ephesians chapter 6, and the good news in this passage is that in Jesus Christ, we have all the strength and all the armory, all the resources we need to resist every temptation and every attack in every season of our lives. It's all sufficient in Jesus Christ. So the passage begins in verse 10, to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, that we may stand against the devil. And then last week, we looked at the outworking of the command to put on the full armor of God, and we looked at the first three awesome pieces of that armor. And uh, we might just review that, although our passage for today is verses 16 to 17, we don't want to forget that that's only half the armor, and we looked at the other half last week, where uh, we looked at verse 14 that said, Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Scotty took us through what that means. And those pieces of the armor were kind of uh, long-term fixtures on the Roman soldier. That was his everyday dress, uh, workwear. So Paul, as he's guarded in prison, his uh, prison guards would have been wearing those things every day. These next three pieces that we look at were the heavy duty battle wear. So a Roman soldier wouldn't have come in to guard Paul, who was uh, a medium or light risk prisoner, wearing a great heavy iron helmet, waving around a sword or with the great massive shield. But they always had these things ready and on hand for when a battle commenced. And the analogy with us as Christians is we have to always be ready to battle Satan. We have to have these things always in reach, ready to use. It's a bit like when I'm at Soda Cafe, a lot of police officers actually go in there just for a cup of coffee, uh, which I find kind of amusing. But anyway, um, you'll see these uh, men and women come in, and of course, they'll be wearing the proper footwear for their job. They'll have their belt on, it might have a taser in it, might have handcuffs on it. But and they often will be wearing the vest with a bit of, um, you know, a bit of uh, bulletproofing on it. But generally, and I've never seen them uh, carrying a gun into the cafe when they're going to have a cup of coffee or um, riot gear, you know, not a hard helmet or a big shield. But those things are available to policemen for when they need it, for when real heavy duty uh, action comes. And so... This is what we're looking at, these heavy duty, uh, really in the thick of battle pieces of armory are what we're looking at today here in verse 16, which why it begins in addition to all this, or some translations say 
above all these others. So you've got all these others on already, but in addition, when the battle uh, rages, you need to put on these pieces, and we'll look at them one at a time. The first is the shield of faith. We need to take up the shield of faith. Verse 16, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. If you were a fan of uh, the Asterix comics like me, you're very familiar with these shields. Asterix and Obelix tended to smash a lot of them up and whack around Roman soldiers with them. Uh, but this is the large Roman shield, not the small round wooden one that like a gladiator would use, but like a proper battle shield. And uh, people were a bit shorter in those days, so it was pretty much the length of your average man. It Actually, the word that's used here for shield comes from the word that was used for door. And these things were pretty much the size and shape of a door, but convex, so they were curved outwards, uh, which uh, helped arrows in that to glance off them. They were made out of two wooden planks that were glued together, and they were covered by canvas and then calfskin, which is important, and then they were embossed with bits of metal around the outside, and you'll see in the middle there as well, and that metal could be used kind of like a weapon to push into people. But the calfskin and the canvas were very important because what happened is just before battle, they would soak the shield in water and the canvas and the calfskin would absorb that water, which is important with what Paul talks about here, how it can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. So in combat in those days, uh, the archers, and they also had machines that could uh, fire off multiple arrows, they'd just fire them out and they'd be wrapped in cloth with pitch on them and often uh, lit so that when they uh, hit a man, they would kind of um, spatter and cause all sorts of horrible injuries. But the Romans, if they had their shields up, it would extinguish those arrows, totally put out the fire and stop them from causing further mayhem. And you'll be familiar if you read Asterix with that tortoise shell formation, uh, the tortoise formation that the Roman soldiers perfected. And that reminds us that this is not just an individual battle that you face, but an army battle, a team where together we need to lock our shields together, hunker down together to resist the enemy's attacks. And the Romans really mastered that so that they had it almost like a little fort made out of shields all around them, uh, and they could actually march forward like that and then engage the enemy, having uh, extinguished all those flaming arrows. Here's the spiritual analogy. Our great defense is the shield of faith, of faith, because it's with that that we put out the flaming arrows of the evil one, the devil, and his forces. What are those flaming arrows? They are all sorts of attacks and temptations that the devil fires at us to take our focus off Jesus Christ uh, and to distract us from our trust in him. And the great defense against that is faith, the shield of faith. Faith is trust, personal trust in God and Christ and his word. And that doesn't just um, uh, make the attack a, a bit less stingy. It totally extinguishes the flaming arrows. It puts them out. It totally deals to them. Because you see, faith really is the sum and substance of Christianity. It's the beginning and end of the Christian life. Paul makes that clear in his marvelous letter where his fullest statement of Christian doctrine and commands the book of Romans. And at the outset of that, he says in Romans 1.17, quoting from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, that the righteous person will live by faith. The Christian life is by faith 
from first to life. We're saved by faith. We come to Christ by faith for justification, for being set right with God. And we continue to live by faith day by day, by trust in God. And Paul repeats that quotation from, from, from Habakkuk that the righteous person lives by faith in Galatians. It comes up again in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, and adds from the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, the Greek translation of it, that the righteous person will live by faith, but if he shrinks back in unbelief, God says, I will have no pleasure in him. Which reminds us that faith is standing strong, is having convictions in what we know, and not shrinking back in fear. Faith overcomes fear. One of the great examples of faith is a man called John G. Payton, a Scottish missionary to the place we now call Vanuatu. Some of you will have been there for a nice luxury holiday. It was called New Hebrides when John G. Payton went there as a pioneer missionary in 1858. That was an extremely courageous thing to do because the most recent missionaries there from London had been killed within minutes of landing on shore there and they'd been eaten by the locals who were cannibals. And on one account, uh, before leaving, a respected elder of his church came to John Payton and said to him these encouraging words, you'll be eaten by cannibals. To which John Payton said this, it's reported, Mr. Dixon, the name of this respected elder, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave where you will be eaten by worms. I confess to you that I can but live serving and honoring Jesus Christ, and it will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or eaten by worms. Now that, friends, is faith. That faith is all about our perspective. Are we looking at the circumstances we face, the problems and dangers and restrictions we face, or are we looking at God's perspective, an eternal perspective that says this life is short. If I wear myself out for God, it doesn't really matter. I have an eternal reward. I have an eternal future. Faith overcomes fear. And Faith overcomes difficulties. John Payton, in reaching out to the unreached people there in what we call Vanuatu now, faced all sorts of setbacks and difficulties. His wife died. His child died. He had all sorts of dangers he overcame. His whole life was marked by faith and was an illustration of what 1 John 5, 4 says. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. And he also gave us a wonderful definition and illustration of faith because as missionaries do, like Jason and Shirley Birkin over in the Philippines, he needed to translate the Bible into the language of the local people. But he found that they had no word for faith. They were such a lost society that they had no word for trust or faith. But one day, uh, one of the natives ran into his house. He had uh, something to say to him, and he was huffing and puffing, and he sort of collapsed into a chair, and then he said in the local language, how good it feels to rest my whole weight in this chair. And John Payton thought, aha, that's it. That's how I explain faith. Faith is resting your whole weight in God. So that's how he translated faith in the New Testament, resting your weight in God. And I have to ask you, are you resting your whole weight in God? Are you relying on the shield of faith? Or are you having, trying to have it a bit both ways? I'll rest part of my weight in God. I'll um, kind of have part of the shield. No, you need complete faith, trust in God, the shield of faith. So we take up the shield of faith and we also take up the helmet of salvation, verse 17. Now, the Roman helmet, which you see there on the PowerPoint by this stage was heavy, hot and uncomfortable. 
I remember an amusing incident when uh, the family and I were shopping for some ski gear, which is unusual for us. And uh, Megan thought she might just buy a helmet instead of renting one, a ski helmet, uh, save from falling snow and stuff. And this um, girl, I think she was a student just filling in, she had a bit of a sense of humor, the girl who was serving us. And she said to Megan, oh, that looks really good for you, good on you. Is that for everyday wear, street wear, you know? Which, um, yeah, of course, no, it's not. It's for a particular purpose. And so it was with the Roman helmet. You didn't wear it every day, just on your civilian duties. You wore it for battle and it was essential. As you can see there, it was generally made out of bronze uh, over a leather sort of a skull cap. And uh, as it developed, it had uh, the side um, visor sort of guards. And very importantly, it had the bit down the back that protected your neck because these guys didn't muck around in warfare in those days. So the obvious way, if you couldn't knock the people out at long range with arrows, was to send in your cavalry with big broadswords and try to swipe their heads off from, a, from the horse. And obviously, if you didn't have your helmet on, you were fair game for death. So the helmet was an essential piece of armor, absolutely vital. The analogy for the Christian life is that we need to be wearing the helmet of salvation, which is not just the fact that we are saved, and I hope you are. If you're not saved, you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ and be saved from the penalty, power, and ultimately you will be saved from the presence of sin. That's all through faith in Christ. But the helmet of salvation more has to do with the assurance of salvation the certain hope of salvation. I say that because I cross-reference it to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8 to 11. If you've got your Bible with you, let's just um, elaborate the helmet of salvation from there. Where Paul says, since we belong to the day, 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, that's his anger, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, the hope of salvation, the helmet of the hope of salvation is that assurance that you will never face God's condemnation, his judgment, or his wrath because it was all paid for by Jesus Christ. And the assurance that you're going to make it to ultimate victory, ultimate deliverance. You're going to make it to heaven. You're not going to get so far and then get a mortal head wound and not make it in your spiritual life. The book of Philippians says, he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Jesus himself said in John 10, no one can pluck my sheep out of my hand. My father who gave them to me is greater than all and no one can pluck them out of his hand. If you think of the sporting analogy, when you're playing sports, right? You're doing okay as long as you believe that you can win and you're going to win. But when that doubt creeps in, you think, wow, this game is really getting beyond us as a team. We're not going to make it. Then it's as good as over because you'll do something desperate. You'll scramble around. You'll lose your focus. Now, in the Christian life, it's not about self-belief. It's about, as we've seen, trust in God. But a big part of that is trusting that salvation is God's work and he'll carry it through to completion. We sing that song, he will hold me fast. And it's so important. The devil's big blows to the mind are in the areas of doubt and discouragement and condemnation. So when you sin, he'll say, you've done it now. You've done the unpardonable sin or you've done the sin too many times. You're never going to get victory and God's going to be done with you. And he'll take you maybe to those passages about, you know, if you willfully sin, um, you're in big trouble type of stuff. 
But you need to come back to those verses that give you the assurance of salvation. Romans chapter 8, nothing can separate us from God's love. Why is that? Because as it says earlier on in Romans 8, those who God foreknew, which means favored before time began, those who God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And those he predestined, he also justified. Those he justified, he also called. And those he called, he also glorified. So it's an unbroken golden chain of salvation from election and eternity past to glorification and for the eternal future. And in between, you've been called to Christ. You've been justified. He's not going to leave it at that. He's going to see the work through. So if you lack that assurance of salvation, it really is essential to settle it. Without that, it's like going into battle without a helmet. You're going to be fair game. Get your helmet on. Get your assurance of salvation. Remind yourself when you're under attack, hey, whatever the devil do, does to me, he can't steal my salvation. The thief comes to rob, steal, and destroy, but he can't steal a Christian's most precious possession, which is Jesus Christ himself, our salvation. He can't take the Holy Spirit from you. You're sealed. He can't rob you of your salvation, and you need to stand on that, wearing the helmet of salvation. So, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and finally, the sword of the Spirit, verse 17b. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Here's a unique piece in the armor, because it's not really armor, is it? It's a weapon. And yet it's also a means of defense, because a sword is dual purpose. It can parry or block an attack, but it can also thrust home and counterattack. So that's why the word of God is so, so important in a Christian's life. It defends Satan's specific attacks, and you can give him a good wallop with him and send, it, send him packing. The sword of the Spirit. The Roman sword was not a great big broadsword that you um, wield with two hands. It was known as a gladius, from which we get the word gladiator. Uh, if you've seen that film, uh, Maximus there is not using a large sword. It was bigger than a dagger, but really it was a short sword, uh, about 60 centimeters long and five centimeters wide, so not massive, and it was for close hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now, the word for word, the, um, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, the word for word here is the Greek word rhema, which refers to a spoken word. So it's not just saying, you know, if you have the written Bible, you've got the sword of the Spirit and, you know, that will just do you fine. What it's saying is you need to be able to take the specific uh, relevant part of the word of God and speak it to yourself and maybe even speak it against the devil or the satanic spirit under him that is attacking you. And we see that Jesus was a master swordsman when he was tempted uh, in the wilderness. What did he do? Satan came against him and said subtly, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Notice that Jesus didn't just say, look, I'm the son of God, go away. By my own power, I command you to go away. He used the sword of the spirit. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And he did that with the other two temptations as well. He used specific scripture that was relevant to the temptation that the devil through against them. So can I ask you, what's your big pitfall area? Do you struggle with lust? Well, then learn some verses that deal with that, that you can quote to yourself and wield against the devil when he attacks you. Is it gossip? Then 
Uh, go to Ephesians 5 and learn about the importance of speaking the truth and love. Uh, whatever area it is, find something specific in the Bible, speaks to that area, memorize it, and wield it against Satan. It's the most powerful form of defense. It sends them packing. Looking at it the other way, I've you know, you've got a lot of cricket analogies for Scotty, but cricket's not my sport. I usually uh, scored in single digits if I wielded a bat in cricket. But I played a lot of tennis. And, you know, the greatest tennis player in the world, Novak Djokovic, he hasn't been able to compete in the Australian Open. But look, I could beat him if he wasn't allowed to bring a tennis racket onto the court, if he had to use his hand to try and hit the ball back. I could beat Rafael Nadal, I could beat Roger Federer, and I'm not that great a tennis player because the tennis racket is the one essential piece of equipment for a tennis player. No good having the fancy shoes, the headband, uh, the sweat-absorbing clothing, the wristbands, if you don't have a tennis racket. And the tragedy in the modern church is that Christians will say, wow, I'm into the spirit, I don't know if I need all this Bible stuff. Look, the Bible is the sword of the Spirit. It's the cutting edge by which the Spirit wants to work in your life. It was authored by the Spirit. We looked at that last week, 1 Timothy 3.16. God breathed, theoneustos. The word neustos is um, the same word for Spirit. So Spirit-given, Spirit-empowered, the Word of God. As you memorize it, meditate on it, and use it against the devil, it is so, so powerful. Don't neglect it. Particularly if you're a young person, there is no better time in your life than when you're young to memorize scripture. Because as you get older, the old memory is not as good. It's the best time to learn another language and learn all sorts of things. But it's a particularly great time to memorize scripture. Psalm 119 says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word the psalmist says to God. And then he says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And I'm so glad I got into a lot of scripture memory when I was a new Christian, aged 18 to 22. I just got so into it. And um, a lot of that comes back to me when I'm tempted, uh, when I really need it. And I don't, I don't resent or uh, um, feel bad about any of the time I spent learning that it was a great investment. Memorize the word of God and use it. Well, you might be thinking, wow, all this spiritual battle stuff sounds very serious, very hardcore. Where's the joy in all of this? It just sounds like hard work. Well, think about this. There's really no joy in defeat, but there's a lot of joy in victory. You know, one of the greatest parties that um, our nation and England and other allies in World War II have ever seen was VE Day, Victory in Europe. The joy of defeating the enemy and when the war is over. So our ultimate party and celebration is coming in heaven. But there's also joy in defeating the devil in your own life and seeing spiritual progress. And it's possible. You have all the resources you need, all the power you need, and there's a joy and living for Christ and standing against the devil. There's also a joy in the camaraderie that comes in this battle. You know, some of the closest friendships people have had have been forged during wartime because they've faced really hard times together. And you see old mates down at the RSA, less nowadays as a lot of them have died, but it's a really tight bond. And that's how it can be for us Christians too. If we've faced a few attacks together, it really cements those friendships and relationships as we pray for one another, support one another. I love the scene in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress where there's a group of pilgrims on their way to the celestial city, the city of God, heaven, and they're escorted through the dangerous uh, area they're traveling by a warrior called uh, Mr. Greatheart. And on one stage, they come across a man with a sword drawn, and he looks like he's been beaten up. He's got a blood nose, and he's uh, seen the wars. 
And uh, they ask him who he is, and he says his name is Mr. Valiant for Truth, and that he's just withstood three robbers that came against him to try and dispossess him of his spiritual treasure. But he saw them off with his sword. And then Mr. Greatheart says to Mr. Valiant for Truth, you've done well. Let me see your sword. So he shows it to him. And when he had taken it in his hand, he looks on it a while and he says, wow, that's a real Jerusalem blade. And Mr. Valiant says, it is so. Let a man have one of these blades with a hand to wield it and skill to use it, and he may venture against an angel with it. Its edges will never grow blunt. It can cut flesh and bones and spirit and soul and all. That's the power of the word of God. Then says Mr. Greatheart to him, but you fought for a long time. I'm amazed that you're not so weary. And Mr. Valiant said, I fought till my sword cleaved to my hand. And when my hand and my sword were joined together, I fought as if a sword grew out of my arm. And when the blood ran through my fingers, then I fought with the most courage. And Greatheart says to him, you've done well. You have resisted to blood, striving against sin. You should stay with us and come along with us, for we are your companions. And friends, that's how it should be for us. The greatest friendships are forged in the heat of the spiritual battle. That's where the victories are won. But you need your sword. You need your helmet. You need your shield of faith and the other three pieces that we looked at last week. And that's the only way to stand firm until that glorious day when we do have final victory, final celebration, and no more struggle. Let's look forward to that day as we pray together. Father, we just thank you that in Christ you've given us all the strength and all the resources, all the armor and weaponry we need for victory. And uh, we just thank you that there is a time when the battle will end, when you come for your church, Lord Jesus, to catch us up with you in the clouds. But until then, help us to stand firm against every attack, to win the victory, to support one another, to wield the armor and wear it well. Strengthen us by your mighty power. And may this year be a year of victory in our lives as never before in growing measure. And we pray that in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.